Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Our New Testament reading is from the book called The Acts of the Apostles, or just Acts, depending on your English uh, translation. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, in the Sanctuary Bible, page 1690. And once again, let us listen to the word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, and parenthetically, the writer of Acts, Luke, is referring to his gospel called the Gospel of Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. And they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, they all joined together in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Love of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So you've uh, noticed in the last few sermons, we've been uh, focusing on the first chapter of the book of Acts. And as mentioned, uh, uh, Luke, a doctor, not an apostle, um, 
became part of the, uh, the team that the Apostle Paul had put together to travel throughout the uh, Roman world along the Mediterranean coastline and further inland to preach the gospel, to evangelize, to form churches, and to basically get Christianity uh, up off the runway and into the air, so to speak. And of course, it has never stopped growing since then. The words that we just heard read were some of the very last words Jesus said while on planet Earth, before he was taken up by the power of Almighty God and then received back into heaven to rejoin uh, the Father at the Father's uh, right hand side. And that's where Jesus uh, is and has been for the last 1990 years or so. You may recall that at the end of uh, three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, some of the words of Jesus are uh, recorded. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, at the very end, uh, Matthew wrote, uh, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go, uh, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. What Matthew didn't do is what Luke did at the end of his gospel and at the beginning of his book, the book of Acts. It's not that Matthew was incorrect. Matthew just omitted that saying of Jesus. Uh, Matthew did not mention the ascension, and he didn't mention that Jesus made a promise to send the Holy Spirit, nor did Matthew or uh, other gospel writers uh, like Mark. Uh, they didn't record Jesus' words, which was a command uh, for them to wait, for the apostles to wait uh, in Jerusalem in order to uh, be baptized by the Holy Spirit to receive the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, Mark quotes uh, at the end of his gospel, Mark quotes Jesus as saying, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. There will be signs for those who believe, etc., etc. And then Mark mentions the ascension. But again, uh, Mark did not cho choose when he was putting his gospel account together to refer to Jesus' command to wait and for the apostles to be baptized uh, to receive uh, the Holy Spirit. John uh, does not mention that as well, but Luke does both in his gospel and in uh, the book of Acts. So I mention that not to try to uh, impress you with biblical insights or even what may sound like trivia, uh, but to just point out that when we put all of the Gospels together uh, into like a, a harmonious narrative of the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ, what we find is that after his, what we read, uh, is that Jesus uh, suffered, as we say in our creeds. Uh, he died by crucifixion. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead and appeared to many, and then he ascended into heaven. And then, uh, more specific to that, prior to his ascension, as Luke uh, recalled, uh, likely through the many eyewitnesses that he had talked to when he put his gospel account together uh, and Acts, that Jesus commanded them, wait in Jerusalem. Uh, wait for the promised Holy Spirit. It's interesting that uh, what uh, Jesus didn't say was, after I ascend, I want you to go out and preach the gospel. No, he didn't say that. He might have said something like, I want you to go out and start healing people after I ascend back to the Father. No, he didn't say that. I want you to start churches. Uh, I want you to teach people what I taught. 
He didn't say that. What did he say? He said, wait. Wait in Jerusalem uh, so that you may receive the promised Holy Spirit. And as we read or heard read in, in the book of Acts, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. And you will then be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the whole world. Uh, Jesus knew that if he sent them out to preach, if he sent them out to make disciples, if he sent them out to plant churches and evangelize, without the power of God in them and among them, without being baptized in the Holy Spirit, the entire enterprise would fail. Christianity would never have gotten off the tarmac, uh, if you will. Waiting on the Lord. Uh, a lot of uh, Old Testament passages and even New Testament passages interchange the words wait and hope. Uh, even in Isaiah, uh, we find the translation, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Uh, some English translations have uh, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Uh, the idea is to... Uh, be still, and Isaiah said this in another passage, chapter 26, be still and know that I am God, uh, Isaiah wrote. The idea is to remain and not move forward in human endeavor, uh, strength, or resources, but to wait for God's empowerment, God's enablement, God's leading and guidance, God's spirit, God's promised empowerment to do what God wants us uh, to do. If you're like me, you've, uh, you can recall times when you move forward in your Christian experience and you, you thought you were doing what, what God was uh, leading you to do only to find out later that, gee, I thought it was what God wanted me to do, but I guess it was just Mike thinking what God wanted Mike to do, but not actually what God was leading uh, Mike to do what what I thought God was leading me to do. What's the difference? How do we know if it's just our notions about what God wants us to do or if it's actually God's Spirit through what only the Spirit can do uh, speaking quietly within our souls prompting us to discern and to follow what it is uh, God is is leading us to do. The answer to that question was read a few moments ago. What did the 11 apostles, and they were all listed there by name, and some of the women disciples, the female disciples, including Mary, Jesus' mother, and Jesus' brothers. You may recall that two of Jesus' brothers, uh, James and uh, Jude, ended up writing New Testament books, the book of James and, and the book of Jude. Uh, they're there at the end of the New Testament before Revelation. What did they do? Well, they did what Jesus told them to do. They, they went uh, back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and they waited. But how did they wait? Do you remember what was said about how they waited? Well, they prayed. They prayed, and it's estimated that this was about a 10-day uh, period before Pentecost, before the church was baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit. And they prayed. And uh, Luke's uh, uh, wording implies uh, intensive, constant intercession. That is, not just praying once a day or a couple times a day, but for 10 days, it was like a prayer-a-thon, you know, a mega prayer uh, experience. Try to imagine what the prayers might have been, and typically when uh, Hebrew worshipers in synagogues gathered for prayer, uh, they would often pray traditional prayers. Um, you know, like we, one of our traditional prayers is obviously uh, the prayer Jesus taught his followers to say, our Father who art in heaven, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the Psalms, the book of Psalms are prayers. And many of those prayers were set to music. 
the book of Psalms was the Hebrew hymnal. And, uh, and so it's thought that they uh, said the Psalms. They recited the Psalms together. But it's likely, too, that rabbis, teachers, uh, would instruct members of their synagogues to pray certain prayers. And those kinds of prayers are found in uh, different writings not included in our Bible in the Old Testament or New. What Jesus really wanted to do was to protect the disciples from certain failure. Uh, you know, they had, uh, they had lived with, traveled with, eaten with, uh, camped with Jesus for about three and a half years. They saw him up close and personal. They heard his teachings. They saw his miracles. And on one occasion, Jesus even sent them out to perform all kinds of miracles. Some of them even, uh, some of the apostles even healed the sick from incurable diseases. So they knew what it was to be with Jesus and to be empowered by Jesus uh, to do miraculous things, to do uh, God's will. But what Jesus wanted to make sure was that uh, they didn't leave Jerusalem and start doing their notions and versions of Christianity without Jesus being with them vis-a-vis -vis the power of the Holy Spirit to cause the presence of Jesus to be experienced uh, spiritually speaking. I remember a friend of mine, uh, I was uh, new in the faith, this was while I was in college, and I was all excited about uh, engaging in ministry, uh, Bible study, small group discussions, uh, things like that. And uh, sometimes I, even, I would even skip class in college. Can you imagine that? Missing a class in college. My corporate finance class was... Uh, not those uh, necessary skills or whatever, they were not in my wheelhouse, as it is said. And, uh, but I passed it, got a D plus. <laughs> but instead, I was convinced that I was doing God's will. And uh, that's why I let Rhonda handle the finances in the house. Um, but my friend said to me, Mike, uh, don't go out on your own steam, you know, referring to the way a, a locomotive engine is empowered or other engines. Uh, don't go out in your own strength, your own power. Uh, let the Spirit lead you. Don't get ahead of God's will and do your will instead. And as Isaiah uh, promised God's people 700 years before Christ, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. As the Apostle Paul put it, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, which implies before uh, Paul, if, if we could interpret his words, uh, was saying before I uh, move forward and, and start doing apostolic things like miracles and teachings and writing inspired letters that ended up in the New Testament, uh, Paul allowed Christ's strength to empower and inspire and motivate him. Uh, in his letter to the church in Rome, the churches in Rome, he said, if the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And in the coming weeks, I'll be talking more about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially as we um, worship on Pentecost Sunday. Jesus said this at one point in his ministry. It's one of my favorite scriptures found in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me uh, streams of living water will flow from within them. Referring, of course, to the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given, as John um, said. In another letter to the churches in Galatia, Paul wrote, So I say, live by the Spirit, 
and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, uh, Paul wrote, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So what Paul was saying was, if, if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, that is, if you have believed in Jesus, as Jesus said, whoever believes in me, the Holy Spirit, will flow from within. That is, the Holy Spirit will give God's life from within our inmost souls. Uh, regularly, normally, you know, our new normal as followers of Jesus Christ will be to be kind. Patient, uh, loving, peaceful, joyful, uh, exercising faithfulness, self-control, gentleness. However, the Apostle Paul made it clear, if we do not allow God's Spirit, if we don't wait on the Lord and, and trust in the Lord to empower us with the Holy Spirit, uh, what we will produce is what the Apostle called the fruits of the flesh. So the results of a spirit-less life, that is a life not filled, not directed, empowered, controlled by the Holy Spirit, uh, bears the fruit of impurity, hatred, selfish ambition, rage, envy, sexual immorality, drunkenness, jealousy, and things like that. Another letter Paul wrote, do not be filled with wine that is controlled and, you know, drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word Paul wrote, maybe you've heard me say this before, that we translate be filled, was a nautical term. It was used to describe uh, the sails of boats that, as they were set out on the left of harbor, the sails were, were filled with air. They were, the boat was moved, was empowered by wind and made progress uh, across. We are to be filled with God's breath, the Holy Spirit. But how do we do that? How do we wait on the Lord? And again, as I mentioned earlier, prayer. What is prayer? Well, prayer is not a one-way conversation. Dear God, I need you to do blank. Uh, dear God, it's time to pay bills. I need money. Uh, dear God, I just visited my doctor. Bad news. I need your healing. Uh, dear God, I heard about somebody who had a problem. Do that. Do this. Um, yes, that's part of prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all there is, just the one-way grocery list, you know, the genie and the lamp, if I rub it, God's going to do what I want God to do. The other part of prayer is listening, waiting. And for a lot of us Americans, it's really hard to wait. Because our culture is one of uh, instantaneous opportunity. I can push this button, I can Google something, uh, I can use this appliance or this power tool or turn the keys of my car and I can instantly go anywhere Waiting uh, goes against our grain, especially when we come to a traffic light, like Rhonda and I did several times this morning, and they all seem to get stuck in my mind. How come it's still red? Don't look at me like that, please. My wife's looking at me like... Waiting is hard to do. Praying is hard to do when we think about the kind of prayer that involves listening to God say something to us. As if it was supposed to just be one way, conversation going up, but nothing coming down. But there's always something coming back. Um, it's God's Word, the Bible. Yeah, that's a hymnal, but I don't have a Bible around to lift up. Um, there are Bibles. <laughs> so prayer is a dialogue. 
it's, it's a two-way conversation. And yet, so often we just get into this notion that, well, when I pray, I'll pray when I have to, and something gets broke, and I, then I want God to fix it. Um, how many of you heard of uh, the Bible scholar, teacher, preacher, author, uh, G. Campbell Morgan? Anybody ever hear of G. Campbell Morgan? Uh, he was like the Billy Graham of his day in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, evangelist, Bible teacher, Bible scholar. He wrote this about what it means to wait on the Lord. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means, first, activity under God's command. Wait, Jesus said. Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait. Stay there. Uh, waiting for God means, second, making oneself ready for any new command. Jesus said, wait, that was command number one. The second command was, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Of course, when we read the account of Pentecost, what happened? They get baptized. All of a sudden, they start speaking in different languages to all the different Jewish people from all over the world who understood those languages and heard the message of the gospel of Christ. So, number one, wait. Be empowered by God's strength. Number two, do what I tell you to do. Witness. Speak and do what I tell you to speak and do. And third, uh, G. Campbell Morgan wrote, the ability that is waiting for God is third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Waiting for God means activity under God's command, being ready for any new command that may come, and waiting for God means the ability to do nothing until the command is given. In other words, waiting is obeying. Waiting is not, well, I think this is what Jesus would want me to do, and so I'm going to do it because that's what I think, when actually, often, that may not be uh, the case. One of the ways that the church has learned to wait upon the Lord is by practicing the sacrament of the Lord's table. And you see, uh, we're ready uh, to do that. And to, to receive the bread and the cup, as you know, is to prepare oneself to focus in on what Jesus did in body, soul, and spirit uh, to forgive us so that we could become children of God, so that we could be forgiven all our sins, so that our, uh, our, our bodies and our souls could become containers, temples of God's Holy Spirit, and so that we could wait on the Lord and be empowered by the Holy Spirit to please God and to serve God and to bring glory uh, to God and to see the fruit of the Holy Spirit produced uh, in our lives.